Hello, I am sitting here in the studio in The World Transformed with the excellent David Graeber, uh, who has just, I believe, been on a whirlwind tour of Europe, uh, spreading the word of bullshit jobs. Uh, and I just want to start with that, really, to, just to say, because this started as an essay, right? And it's uh, an idea that seems to have really struck a nerve. Um, yeah, I had no idea when I wrote it. I mean, I kept meeting people when I came here. I guess, I guess the way to understand how I wrote this is I don't really come from a professional background myself. I come from a working class background. So I've always been trying to figure out what do people actually do in offices all day? I mean, what does professional life actually consist of? And, and I kept finding myself in situations here in the UK where I would meet people and i say, what do you do? And they would say, oh, nothing really. <laughs> and, you know, they thought they were being modest, but if you press them sometimes, they, they actually admit, no, they meant it literally. They're literally doing nothing all day. Uh, so I thought, how common is this? <clears throat> and a friend of mine, a friend of mine was starting a new radical magazine, Strike, and he said, you got anything really provocative, you know, something nobody else would print, um, potentially controversial. I thought, yeah, <laughs> I could do that. Um, so I wrote this piece saying, maybe that's the reason why we're, we're not all working a 15-hour day like we're supposed to have by now. You know, we've created all this technology, like most of the jobs that eliminated in, say, the 1930s have been eliminated, yet we seem to be working, if anything, harder rather than less. You know, maybe they're just making up dummy jobs to keep us busy. It was basically a joke, right? But it just went crazy. I mean, like, like within two weeks, it had been translated into something like 13 different languages. It's up to 28 now. Excellent. It's just come out in Persian. <laughs> Apparently, they have a bullshit jobs problem in Europe. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Because wow, wow. Yeah. I I, I, it does seem to me that it, it picks up that, uh, you know, that, that category of kind of left-wing theory, Marxist theory in particular, mm -hmm. um, uh, that category of alienation, which is obviously kind of important in Marx and then mm -hmm. picked up throughout the 20th century, you know, philosophically as well, developed, mm -hmm. and then kind of sort of seemed to disappear as an analytical framework for a while. Do you see them as resonant? I guess the last gasp of ali real proper alienation theory was the situation. Mm -hmm. so, you know, but they're already like overlapping into alienation, just misery. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is kind of more on the misery side mm -hmm. because you know, alienation is you're separated from the product of your work. Here there is no product of your work. So it's a, I mean, I talk about the trauma of failed influence psychologically. It's the inverse side of the pleasure at being a cause. That, you know, at least an alienated worker has the knowledge that they did do something, mm -hmm. even though they're f incredibly frustrated because, you know, their actions don't belong to themselves. But here their actions not only belong to someone else, but they don't even actually do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, one of the interesting questions I think this brings up is that, so, for like a standard strategic way of thinking on the left is to say, mm. okay, uh, well, a worker can take a special kind of political action because they can gum up the machine of capital mm. when workers organize together mm. and strike, uh, you know, there's a real material, tangible impact. In a world that's characterized by, by bullshit jobs and mm. by these kind of extremely immaterial jobs, does it mean that we have to do a kind of rethinking of that sort of strategy? Well, there are workers of very, very strategic roles, but, but a lot of them, no. I mean, one example that people trundle out a lot is um, the banking strike in Ireland mm -hmm. in the 70s. Um, one of the guys who's an efficiency expert at a bank who, who wrote to me when I was researching the book said that he thought 80% of jobs in banks are just completely useless. But, you know, then there's a question of whether the entire banking industry is useful. <laughs> uh, because, as, as I think Rutger Brehman pointed out, you know, there was one point where they had a strike, so I, I think it was in the same year, a, a garbage strike in New York and a banker's strike in Ireland. And in the case of the garbage collectors, you know, within 11 days, they brought the city to its knees. You know, they basically had to give in to almost all their demands. Um, in the case of the Irish strike, after six months, they gave up because mm -hmm. nobody cared. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out you don't really need banks at all. You can just write checks to each other and the checks will circulate and you just created money. Voila. So, I, 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 you know, this, this question, because, you know, obviously I'm always thinking about you know, politics and political strategy. Um, and, and this question, you know, it leads me to, to this kind of wider sense, because we're here at The World Transformed, mm -hmm. which is a big kind of festival really bringing together, you know, different sides of, of, of a kind of left politics that don't mm -hmm. always meet. I, I just want to think a bit about that with you, because... Strategically. Like, yeah. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. I, I, I think there's a very strategic message that comes from this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that what we need to look at is not that people are trapped in already completely bullshit jobs, but the bullshitization of real work as a, 
as a political issue. Mm -hmm. And this is coming up because increasingly, one of the interesting things that people don't talk about, about automation is that it makes you know, manufacturing much more productive. It has the opposite effect on anything that even vaguely resembles care work. Mm -hmm. So anything like education, health, uh, providing social services, of course, as automation proceeds, more and more jobs are gonna be doing that simply because you don't want mm -hmm. robots mm -hmm. doing that. Um, there was a wonderful example I, I, I found uh, from the tube strike a few years ago, when a lot of Marxists even were saying, well, who needs ticket ticket booths mm -hmm. anyway, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if the capitalists don't need them to hell of them, you know. Uh, and they pointed out that, all right, fine, you know, let's go to a tube station with nobody working there. Let's just hope your child doesn't get lost. You know, let's just hope no drunk guy starts following you around. <laughs> and they went through like, you know, 17 examples yeah, of what yeah, they yeah, actually yeah. do. So even a lot of working class work already is care work, mm -hmm. a lot more than we were willing to acknowledge. And um, so, so as that becomes more important, we need to deal with the fact that you know, automating that stuff is just an excuse to bullshitize it. And that happens because they're constantly adding more and more layers of parasitical administrators on top. I mean, nurses, like uh, right now in New Zealand, apparently, the nurses are on strike. And partly because they haven't got a raise in 10 years. But that's largely because all the money goes to the administrators, so they keep hiring more and giving them raises. But, but it's also because those guys aren't really necessary, so to make some excuse for their existence, they constantly have to make up more and more paperwork. So like a lot of nurses, 50 to 80% mm. of their time is filling out forms. They don't have time to take care of their patients. So they're actually, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it's interesting though, I mean, the question of bureaucracy is always an interesting one, and like particularly it's history, right? Because mm -hmm. it kind of comes out in the French, like after the French Revolution, when they're trying to say, okay, what we need is a state that's kind of transparent rather than based on like right. personal favor mm -hmm. uh, and these kind of like continually paranoiac, right. uh, you know, uh, uh, courting influence. Was that promise ever fulfilled? I mean, there's a certain degree, I imagine, where, imp I mean, obviously, impersonal structures, there are some areas where you definitely want to have impersonal structures mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. some kind. And I don't imagine we'd ever completely get rid of that, even in a sort of libertarian socialist yeah. society. Uh, but what we have seen is that, you know, this weird dynamic for the last, at least the last century, whereby every time there's a liberal reform meant to unleash the market and get rid of paperwork, it actually creates more mm -hmm. paperwork and more bureaucrats than existed before. My favorite statistic about this is um, between, I think it was 1992 and 2001, the total number of bureaucrats, civil servants in Russia increased by 25%. <laughs> that was a during shock therapy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the economy yeah, 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 yeah. shrank by something like that. <laughs> <laughs> they ended up with more civil servants than they had under the Soviets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just mentioning libertarian socialism there, I guess one of the things to talk about here at the festival is that, you know, we have here, you know, a really strange change in the British left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like you and me from a background in movements that have been kind of historically skeptical about institutional politics, about the politics uh, of parties generally, mm -hmm. um, are, I guess, kind of, you know, owning up to the fact that maybe we were a little too uh, broad or, or categorical about about that denial. What do you make of that, this guy, I mean, in particular here at the World Transform, like there's mm -hmm. this, this, you know, you have the social movements, you know, butting up against the party form and thinking about, you know, what it means to work in that sense. Mm -hmm. So, so what, you know, as someone who has spent a long time in the social movement, who's from an anarchist background, um, what do you make of that, th this kind of direction? Well, I think there's a lot of things to be very, very careful about. I should, I mean, I think if we're gonna win, Oh, I'm, and I'm speaking as an good, anarchist. Right? Per, yeah, so I, I want to win. Uh, I don't think a lot of people do want to win. I've come to the conclusion at a certain point that a lot of people, purity is more important than winning. But at the same time, I, I do want to need, I do feel we need to acknowledge that there's real pitfalls. Um, the, that, that preserving a space, the prefigurative space where you're not in any way dependent on funding or political power mm -hmm. is absolutely essential to what we're doing. On the other hand, if we had, do not form any alliances with the parliamentary left, then we're screwed too. Um, I mean, one thing I find so inspiring about the UK is that you know, the, the mainstream left, well, not the mainstream left, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the Blairites aren't left at all. So yeah, um, in a way, Corbyn's become the mainstream left. The, the institutional left here actually understands that you don't want to co-opt um, 
you don't want to simply absorb the extra parliamentary left. You need to have people who are completely independent of you, creating those prefigured spaces, opening up horizons and territories that maybe they can later move into. Um, also, you know, that just make them seem more moderate in comparison. I mean, the right wing has always understood this. That's mm -hmm. why the right is doing so well in America. I used to yell at liberals so much, and they, you know, it's like, don't you understand? Like, you can't actually screw over your radicals on policy issues if you already screw them over on existential <laughs> issues. <laughs> you know, so, it's true. Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's true. Yeah, the right, like, you know, of course they're going to screw over their radicals on policy issues, but, like, they want them to be there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if, if the left, in America was as religious about the First Amendment as the right is about the Second Amendment, Occupy would still mm -hmm. be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like politics would look totally different. So, so, you know, here we have people who understand that, but they don't want to absorb the extra, uh, the extra parliamentary left. And, you know, speaking as someone who is an anarchist and does, feels that it's absolutely critical that there be an autonomous extra parliamentary mm -hmm. left that finds some way of complementarily working with people who are working within the system, I find that inspiring and, and, and incredibly, uh, incredible relief. However, you know, there is the danger that at one point I actually had someone call me from the Corbin camp and suggest that I write an, um, an op-ed, um, opinion piece, calling on people to stop waiting on Corbin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's very, it's yeah, 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 yeah. The, which is nice that they would do that, but on the other hand, it shows a certain danger. Yeah, that the yeah, very yeah. fact that you're mobilizing yeah. on the structure creates a certain passivity. So we have to figure out how to fight that mm -hmm. and how, to, how not to co-opt even passively without realizing what you're doing. And organizationally, momentum is very interesting that way because when it was first founded, it was meant to sort of, on the one hand, sort of divert resources to and encourage people working outside the system. On the other hand, try to reform the Labor Party from within. And you can't use the same structure for both yeah. things. So as it turns out, they really ended up doing the second mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but I think that we need to look around the world of people who have successfully integrated those mm -hmm. two bottom-up and top-down structures. Yeah. And, and, and where, would you, where would you look for that? You know, the, oddly enough, I think that that's something they've managed to do fairly well in Rojava. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I, it's kind of surprising to say because it's a kind of unique historical situation. It's a place where you have the same, well, you have a dual power situation where the same guy set up both the top mm -hmm. down and the bottom up structures. Uh, basically, they're in a situation where in order to be taken seriously by the international community, by aid people, by other powers, you have to have something that looks like a government. Mm -hmm. So they set up something that looks just like a government. It's got a parliament, it's got ministers, it's got all that stuff. Um, you go to the office, you can get forms and you know, they'll stamp documents for you. Um, internally, they don't do that. I, I, you know, when, when I was, when I sort of test case, the last time I was there, I was like, are they really serious when they say they aren't a state? Was what do they do about cars? Mm -hmm. Turns out you don't need a driver's license. They only give you license plates if you're intending to leave the area. And they mm -hmm. do have traffic cops, but you know what they do? They're basically there to um, pull kids out of cars. Say, hey, you're eight, you can't drive. <laughs> 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 so that, that kind yeah. of, that, that, yeah. that, that, that mm -hmm. office structure, that's sort yeah. of the, the so they have the top area. down, yeah, uh, they have the top down, but they also have the bottom up, the Democratic Confederalist mm -hmm. stuff, which, um, or they have delegates on different levels, and what they insist on is it's not a state because anybody with a gun is answerable to the bottom up structures mm -hmm. and not the top mm -hmm. down, so, mm -hmm. so there's no monopoly, of course, of force. Yeah, 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 that's intriguing. I mean, the, 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 the question, of course, that people say is, like, is you know, well, you know, well, who has time to go to all those meetings? Things. Who has time? You know, yeah. to, uh, is there an answer to that that isn't just, you know, alienation is bad? It makes you think. Well, <laughs> that you can't I mean, do I think that in places where there is a long standing tradition of direct democracy, there's two ways of doing that. Either you reduce working hours, I mean, no, either you mm -hmm. do have more time and you make it fun and people yeah. want to do it, um, which is the technique used in many traditional societies. They have like fun rhetoric. When I was in Madagascar, I mean, the rhetoric was so was considered so entertaining and, and so much fun that people would do little sets mm -hmm. in between music, you know, if there's a concert. You know. So like that big yeah. kind of sense of a thick social movement yeah. rather than sort of Yeah, arid. it was beautiful, it was poetic, it yeah. was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, Democratic, wow, sublime. How you really put that guy down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was subtle, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Um, so, so, so yeah, you can, make it, you can make it fun. Or the other thing you could do is you just like, 
I mean, and this is what happened in a lot of kibbutzim I know of. There's like a third of people are going to be political junkies, mm -hmm. and they go to all the meetings, and everybody else is like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but ev they know perfectly well that if they make a decision that other people don't like, those people are going to start showing the meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, equally oppressive to insist people participate than to deny mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's leave it up to people to decide what they want to do. But the knowledge that they could show up at mm -hmm. any time is usually enough to make all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Uh, the democratic sublime. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, it's uh, a pleasure. And we will, uh, I hope, have you on for a longer interview on the show soon. I'd like to talk about the labor implications of bullshitization because I have a thing about that. <laughs> I, I believe there's a, a revolt of the caring classes happening globally mm. and it's up faces real pitfalls because the professional managerial classes who are the basically like the people doing the bullshitization and the enemies of the care workers are also the guys who dominate the mainstream pol left political parties. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, there's a preview for a Navarre FM discussion soon.